Hey, all you awesome ears. You're listening to Tech Policy Grind, the Internet Law and Policy Foundry podcast. This is Emery, and even though I'm conspicuously absent from this upcoming conversation, we have an amazing episode coming right up. Pinal and Joe talk with Angel Diaz, 2017 Fellow of the Foundry and Technology Associate at Gunderson Detmer, about his journey from majoring in English and poetry at UC Berkeley, to working at Google, to advising clients on frontier legal tech issues. Stay tuned for a discussion on the enforceability of NDAs, the finer points of terms of service, which I promise is more interesting than that sounds, privacy, confidentiality, and more. As always, if you like what we're doing, please, it would be a huge help to the show to head to iTunes and leave a review, and you can always follow us and reach out to us anytime on Twitter at Tech Policy Grind. All right, so with all that said, please sit back and enjoy Penal Shah, Joe Jerome, and Angel Diaz on Tech Policy Grind. Today's guest is fellow Angel Diaz, an associate with the technology group at Gunderson Detmer in NYC. Angel, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. At the beginning of every show, I like to ask our guests my favorite question. What are you grinding for? Honestly, paying off my de- student debt. Right? I, <laughs> really, I, I do think it's important that policy discussions around emerging technology continually incorporate questions of race and gender. What made you, what, how did that dawn upon you that that was important? Um, you know, looking at your background, you didn't start off in tech. Yeah, no. So, you know, originally I, I grew up in Los Angeles, California. My parents are both refugees from the civil war in El Salvador and they came over during the 1980s. And while they're now U.S. citizens, when they originally came here, they were undocumented and basically spoke no English. And so this forced me to really early on think about questions around consumer protection, worker privacy and government surveillance. And it also sort of quickly forced me to, to get comfortable with thinking about contracts and the law. And I was basically expected to translate these things for my parents. Um, so... It That's a lot up, of responsibility for a young child. <laughs> yeah, I, I ended up growing my vocabulary quite quickly. Um, you know, I, I think that the interest in technology ended up starting from a pretty early age. I spent a lot of time in public libraries, and that's sort of where I discovered the internet and my love of books. Uh, and so to that end, science fiction became kind of a natural overlap. And I kind of went from reading Star Wars, Young Jedi Knight books to reading Philip K. Dick or the novels of Octavia Butler. And so are you Star Wars over Star Trek? You know what? It's very silly, but I think I, I am. <laughs> Not for any real reason other than when I was a child, I felt like I had to choose one or the other and I couldn't love both. So I just sort of put my head in the sand and did not watch Star Trek. <laughs> that being said, I have started watching it on Netflix and it is very good. So um, I figured you guys were going to bond over this stuff, but I do have a confession, which I don't even know if I should make it, but I've actually never even seen Star Wars. <laughs> I wouldn't see it, honestly. <laughs> So, like, this is, like, really ridiculous, but for the longest time, I thought the guy was saying, look, I'm your father. <laughs> oh, like, that was, like, my, wow. my pop cultural reference for years. Like, you know, like, an Italian guy would be like, look, kid, I'm your father. <laughs> this is yeah, I, I had I hard that. lessons to learn. I, there's so much tech policy in Star Wars. It's just, a, like, it's a giant metaphor for bad data security. Yeah, yeah, I have nephews who really love Star Wars, so I'm probably going to have to watch it with them at some point. I'll let you guys know when I do. Yeah, please do. <laughs> so, so Angel, you, well, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Penel, but so Angel, you, you were an English major, right? And then you ended up at Google? Yeah. So I was a, a poetry and film student primarily at Cal. Um, right. So yeah, really applicable skills to working at Google. <laughs> yeah. So it turned out that I, I graduated a year after the recession and was just kind of frantically Googling jobs for English majors and trying to avoid moving back home to LA. And I just kind of decided like, oh, why don't I just apply to Google? They seem like a cool company. And so I dropped in my resume into their you know, application bin, not really expecting to hear back from them, but they were a very long and arduous six month process. I did eventually get hired by the litigation team there. 
Wait, so did you know that you wanted to get into the legal field in that way? Or were you just looking for anything at that point? By this point, I did have an interest in the law. I had worked at a small litigation shop in Emeryville down the street from Pixar and was really interested in starting to figure out what else I could be interested in. I decided I didn't want to do commercial litigation, but maybe technology was something that I would want to get involved with. Um, and so I wanted to try Google out and it, luckily they hired me. So it was a really special place to really get a sense of a lot of Google's products are starting to undergo some early challenges, whether that was the Viacom case against YouTube or Rosetta Stone's case against Google search. There were a lot of challenges that were being brought to these new technologies and people were starting to think about how do we make these technologies fit into existing frameworks. So some of the early challenges that were being brought against Google products really got me to see that there wasn't a whole lot of case law. Oftentimes, all the lawsuits that were being brought against Google, the precedent was other Google cases. Mm. And, and so it really made me think, oh, this is a body of law that I can actually maybe master and also have a chance to contribute to. And that was really exciting. Tell us a little bit about what kind of issues that you're working on today. So I think like a lot of law firms, we're all on this sort of GDPR deadline and trying to Woo! get all of our... Yeah. <laughs> We yeah. love the GDPR around here. It's like our Y2K <laughs> moment. It's really great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really is. I, have, I haven't heard that analogy before, but yeah, it'll probably pass and everything will be fine. It'll be fine because you will advise your clients to take active <laughs> steps <laughs> to uh, ensure that they can demonstrate at least some level of uh, compliance with the GDPR. But yeah, I think that a lot of what we're doing lately is sort of walking our clients through what they should be doing in terms of inventories of the types of data they're collecting, how they're receiving consent um, to use that data, and being able to sort of, again, talk to a data protection authority about how they're thinking about European privacy. I actually think it's curious. Like, So we, we completely skipped on the f out on the fact that, you know, so you're at Google dealing with a lot of these um, challenges to Google products that have no precedence. And so apparently you decided to go to law school and, you know, there's, there's still a big gap there. How did you get from, from Google to, you know, where you are now? Yeah, you know, I think that for me, I, I feel really lucky. The legal department that Google assembled back in the, like, the late 2000s was really special. And they're kind of all spread throughout various tech companies around California now um, or in Washington, D.C. and other places. And they really sort of encouraged me to think about this as being something that's going to shape the future and something that I wanted to be involved with. Um, and so I decided I wanted to go to law school and try my hand at it. So I, I applied and got back into Berkeley and kind of threw myself into trying to understand how this is all going to work out. So I joined the Berkeley Tech Law Journal. I wrote a note on the Happy Trust decision. I got involved. What's that? Time. Oh gosh! <laughs> You're You're gonna gonna make make we'll talk about their note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I honestly don't remember. It had something to do with the fact that it was like fair use to copy like, publicly available books for libraries, but it was like yeah, it was a pair. It was a pair. Send it to us. Send it to us via email, and we'll insert it in as like in post production. <laughs> <laughs> sure. You can include links. You can get more downloads. God, I don't want that all <laughs> that no doubt at all anymore. I wanted to establish that I knew what I was talking about. I'd rather just move on to what's going on now. Um, but yeah, I, I, to get back on topic, I think that in law school, I really just I wanted to make it clear to an employer that this was something that I had really focused my career on and wanted to show that I was knowledgeable. Um, and I think that as a minority person, you really sort of have to you feel like you have to be twice as good to be taken mm -hmm. seriously. And it really was important to me that there wasn't any doubt in my intellectual ability to handle these questions. Yeah, and not not uh, doubting that that additional tax that we have to pay, but um, do you also feel like because you were a poetry and film major, that <laughs> that was a, like, not, not to, you know, I think it's awesome that you were like, you know, tapping into that creative side, but do you think because of that, people are like, oh, well, you didn't major in like engineering or you didn't, you know, do something like more substantive, quote unquote, that you kind of felt that? You know, I think it's interesting. One of the great things about Google was that they they never really made me feel that way. Uh, they, what they really wanted to see was some 
curiosity around technology. And I had a lot of that and I developed a pretty easy way to learn and just and talk about technical aspects of our products. And another thing that Google did was they kind of, they would have coding classes on campus and it was, I learned how to do a little bit of basic Python and I learned some familiarity, which I think I was able to drop enough buzzwords into an interview to make it clear to potential, let's say a patent litigator that I understood how technology works. Right. Well, and, and let's be honest, by that point, you had the Google pedigree, so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> In addition to the GDPR compliance, a lot of what we do is there are a lot of privacy laws back home. And we want to make sure that if our clients want to send an email or a text message to communicate with their consume, with their customers, or they want to collect biometric data to incorporate into their app, that they're not going to wake up one morning with a class action lawsuit. Ever. Don't get Joe started on biometrics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, at, at the end of the day, we're contract lawyers. Uh, we live in the fine print and we do a lot of our legal advocacy and comment bubbles. And so a big part of my practice is ensuring that my clients have the right contracts in place to secure and commercialize their assets, which for my clients is largely their IP, data, and other confidential information. Yeah. So you really had to sort of um, kind of, you have, I mean, you, ha you have your hands in a lot, right? You're doing privacy, you're doing IP, you're doing contracts, you're doing NDAs, terms of service. Like, I mean, you're, you're doing all of that. Like, did you just kind of get thrown into all of that? Was it trial by fire? How was it um, working and learning those issues, you know, coming from a litigation background? Yeah, I, I think that I'm lucky that my firm has a really great group of lawyers who take the time to sort of walk you through contracts and think about their implications. Um, and really, because our clients tend to be early stage companies, they don't have the same amount of financial resources that perhaps a Google or a Facebook might have. Right. So you very quickly have to learn practical lawyering. We can't afford to do seven to 10 drafts of an indemnity. You have right. to be able to just do one or two and you'd be able to advise your client, practically speaking, here's what you need to be protected. Everything else is just we can live with. Yeah. So let's let's get to actually talking about some of the issues that come up in your day to day work. So right now, NDAs, right? At this point, almost all of us had have had to sign one at some point about something, um, especially with the, the Me Too movement right now. NDAs have really come to light as an oft used device to you know keep people quiet. Um, let's talk about you know, the use, abuse, and enforceability. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I, I think that NDAs are a great example of how a document that's intended to protect valuable confidential information can easily be misused in a manner that silences important public debate, uh, covers up abusive and even illegal behavior, and ultimately becomes a tool for reinforcing existing gender inequalities and perpetuating white supremacy, by which I mean white male supremacy. Um, fortunately, I think that some of the more egregious NDAs that have come to light during the current discussions around the Me Too movement are likely unenforceable. I think we're in a special moment where there is a renewed public attention into the contracts that we normally sign without batting an eye. And I think that journalists and other activists have the ability to really keep the public informed about being taken another step back before they just mindlessly agree to a contract. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that at the same time, it's important at the outset to, to really think about the common scenarios in which we encounter confidentiality provisions or perhaps a non-disparagement clause. And that's an actual NDA, an employment agreement, or a severance or settlement agreement. And each of these contracts have to be supported by consideration, as we learned in first-year contracts. But the actual consideration that's exchanged may actually make it more or less enforceable in a court. Right? Mm -hmm. Of the three, I think that the NDA is actually sort of the least strong because what you're really exchanging is you're exchanging information in exchange for a promise to keep a secret. Mm -hmm. Whereas in an employment agreement, you are saying in exchange for my biweekly paycheck, I'm going to keep information about my employer that I learned confidential or in the settlement context, I'm going to receive a substantial sum of money in exchange for my silence when it comes to certain allegations. Mm -hmm. So what's the worst that can happen to me? So I, I work at the Center for Democracy and Technology, and we actually <laughs> sign a number of, of NDAs with companies that want to come and talk to us about 
But their privacy policies, their terms of services, and their new products are all things you're counseling them on. Um, mm-hmm. What happens if I if I spill the beans? Well, <laughs> don't spill the beans. You can be a good person. Um, and, and I think you're bringing up a good point, which is that you know a lot of the discussions around the abuse of NDAs has a lot of people are talking about why do we have them and we should just get rid of them entirely and. NDAs are really important tools that help companies and individuals protect their ideas. Um, mm-hmm. I think that you, if, if they're properly drafted, they give a narrow scope around what is confidential, what are your requirements, and importantly, what are the circumstances in which information that you learned from one of these companies that came to talk to you is no longer public and is no longer confidential information. And that actually has a lot of that's standard language, but it is important language. So ordinarily speaking, information that's in the public domain or is already known by the receiving party isn't confidential. And if you receive that information from a third party that isn't bound by a confidentiality obligation, it no longer is confidential. So this idea that confidential information is perpetual is just frankly not true. And especially in the technology space, information gets stale Quickly. Well, um, I, I guess we should move on to talk a little bit more about about terms of service. And we've been talking a lot about, I guess, how technology intersects with contracts. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I guess as the as the advocate in the room, um, I, I guess I'm curious to get your thoughts on to whether these things are one sided or not. Um, and you know, the interesting example of that, I think, is situations we were going to talk a little bit about about how the president, and Pinal mentioned up top that we're at a year into Trump, um, Mm -hmm. if nothing, his social media proclivities have increased. And it's pretty apparent that um, while I think some people would argue that he has been violating various terms of service on Twitter, as a platform, they've made it pretty clear they they have no intention of of taking, getting rid of him in any way because of the the news value and public importance of him being Mm -hmm. out there. Um, At the same time, you know, it's pretty easy for people to get booted from Twitter for pretty arbitrary right. things, and that's guaranteed in Twitter's terms of service. So, how do you think about that type of stuff? Yeah, I think first off, Twitter can terminate whoever they want from their platform. Right. Uh, they they have pretty as a publisher, they have First Amendment rights, and they have a pretty broad immunity under CDA two thirty. This is not a space where we, at the moment, have a right to demand to be able to be to be. And yes, as as a counsel for companies that draft terms of service like this, you need to have some flexibility around the kind of community that you want to build. And that may shift over time. And I I think that when you get to the size of Twitter or Facebook or Google, it's everybody, right? We we don't necessarily, it's not a, a hobbyist community of horticulturists. It is horticulturists plus Nazis. And you really have to have some flexibility with what it is that you want your platform to look like, what kind of voices you want to value. And frankly, you have to be able to think about the fact that these are companies that need to commercialize their assets. And so ultimately, these are ad, ad companies. And so they need to be able to say to advertisers, I have an engaged consumer base that you can serve ads to. And that is what's going to sustain a business. And it's, so to your point, it's not really in Twitter's best interest to kick off the president of the United States if it means that people are going to go to a different platform to get to learn what he's saying about foreign policy or the size of his button. But then doesn't that mean that the terms of service lose all credibility if they're just picking and choosing? And I totally get what you're saying from a business case point of view, but how do you reconcile that with kicking somebody off you know, for much less egregious language or comments on Twitter. I think you could make the argument that in terms of service, like our actual laws are applied inequally and <laughs> not uniformly applied across different populations. So yes, you are correct that you are But not- Twitter would never say that. They're never going to say that. <laughs> And we're no. not trying to throw Twitter under the bus here, by the way. I love Twitter. Oh, I, we all love Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think that, honestly, what we need to t- talk about when it comes to Twitter is that we, we've we kind of built up these tech companies with cool employees and bouncy balls and free lunches as sort of an idealized world in which 
we get another bite at the apple when it comes to forming our communities and how we talk, how we think about speech and how we think about advocacy. Um, in reality, they're not, the laws don't apply to them that way right now. And I, I, I think that we are turning to Twitter or Facebook because we're frustrated. Some of us are frustrated around the direction of our country. And we are upset at what Donald Trump is saying. We want to be able to see an immediate way to mm -hmm. take action. And turning to Twitter is how a lot of us get cathartic release and can, can complain right. or make a... a, a or a hilarious comment. memes that give us right. life. Right. Exactly. And I think that, well, that's great. It, we, it cannot be a replacement for engagement with our political process. And if you don't like Trump's foreign policy with, with North Korea, your recourse is to advocate and to get elected officials that you care about into office and get Trump out of office, not to mm -hmm. expect Twitter to agree with your political leanings and to take off the users that you don't like. Right. And, and, and to I, be fair, this is probably a, a one-off. I mean, I can't imagine the next president is going to be as you know, Twitter heavy with their fingers. Yeah, I just want Oprah to give me a car. <laughs> Somebody want, some people want Oprah to run for president, which is <laughs> a whole other story. Another thing to think about in terms of these tech companies is they, because we have, we give them discretion into who is and is not allowed onto the platform, you are largely at the whim of important people in these companies. So on the one hand, we are excited when people take a stand and kick off the Daily Stormer or the way in which uh, Twitter made a decision to kick off uh, his name, Charles Charles Johnson. Charles Johnson. Um, at the same time, that you know, it just goes to show that your your access to a public sphere or a pseudo public sphere is largely determined by a handful of companies in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's an, actually an interesting question because I want to know, like, so you you draft terms of service for these for these companies. Do you actually then inform them or counsel them on the policy of how to enforce the terms of service? Do you play yeah. that follow up role as well? Yes. So, okay. a terms of service is a basically a working policy that allows companies to say, "Welcome to our service. Here are the rules by which you will abide if you're going to hang out with us." And oftentimes, some of the users don't abide by those laws or those rules, and they have to decide what actions do we want to take. And I think as a practical question, there is, there is the rules and what, that's gonna, what they actually look like in practice. So if you kick somebody off of your platform and they are not important, the likelihood of having serious repercussions is not that large. Right. But if you kick off the president of the United States, it's much larger. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's important as you're starting to, when you're a younger company and you want to build up a user base, you have to focus on that user. And you have to think about who is it that's going to increase the use of my platform, because those are the users that I really want to focus my attention towards. Right. And, and so in that way, it's dissimilar to like, say, you know, laws and regulations in which theoretically we all should be treated equally treated equally, not tweeted equally <laughs> under the law in terms of everyone, you know, no one is above the law yet in sort of the Twitter world or in, 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 you know, in the corporate world, people are above the law because it's about money and it's about, you know, getting your product out there. Yeah. And I think that really connects to your, our earlier discussions around NDAs because ultimately what we're talking about are questions of power. Many of the most aggressively drafted NDA provisions, the lawyers are hoping that these contracts will never go in front of a judge. You are a, you're wielding power in a way that is scary. And as lawyers, we are well-versed in writing obscure, aggressive language that will scare the everyday person. And indeed, we've had many media accounts of people feeling afraid of the language that they see in their NDAs. But in reality, Judges would have to balance public interest factors when trying to decide whether or not to enforce an NDA. And having someone want to cover up their abusive behavior is not really going to be in the public interest. But again, part of my job when it comes to advising companies is to tell them 
what I can draft for you and how much, how far are you really willing to go? And so mm -hmm. I think that my role when I advise companies when it comes to a non-disclosure agreement or more commonly when it comes to a non-compete clause or a non-solicit clause is drafting it in a way that is narrow enough to protect the business interests, but also allows a court to say, okay, well, it also is being respectful of the fact that an employee needs to be able to make a living and needs to be able to go elsewhere and continue to develop their career. And mm -hmm. even after I draft a narrow version of that agreement, I still have to advise a client and tell them it's not clear whether or not this will be upheld by a court. And you mm -hmm. have to be willing to file a, an action in a court and go through all those steps, show all the steps that you need to get an injunction. It's not guaranteed. And when you take into consideration the fact that there is unequal bargaining positions between an employee who needs to agree to your contract in order to get a paycheck and you who has a high powered New York law firm drafting your agreements, you it will not be seen as an equal, an equal argument, an equal bargaining power. Mm -hmm. So this theme of, I guess, you know, power relationships, I think is sort of been the, the thread of this entire conversation, but since since you're an actual practicing lawyer, um, I, I have to ask how you think about terms of service in relation to other laws, because I mean, we've already seen companies use terms of service as a hook to bring um, cases against individual users under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which you know is a, a federal criminal hacking statute, so violations of terms of service are suggested to be um, things where users are exceeding act, uh, authorized access. Just recently uh, is the situation where um, a, a charter school basically required um, a parent to uh, agree to a ter to, to have their child enrolled in the school, had to agree to a term of service that effectively waived um, the family's the FERPA, which is the student privacy law, their FERPA right. rights. Um, so, you know, I think you were just sort of saying that, you know, what you're putting in the language might not necessarily be what a judge would like in terms of public interest, but how do you think about those types of things? I think you need to really take it on a case-by-case -case basis. So sure. in the instance of FERPA, we're talking about a, a law that is intended to protect student privacy and more pointedly, minor privacy. And I think that you really have to think about the fact that if you're going to offer a service that is Whose primary, whose primary user base are minor students, the law is not going to look very favorably on you being too liberal with giving up rights and the protections that the law has built in. So in the instance of FERPA, we have passed laws that grant parents the right to understand the information that's being collected about their, their children and being able to opt out of it. And I think that it's important if you're going to enter the educational technology space to understand that there is a whole set of federal and state laws that regulate the use of student privacy, or student data rather. And you have to have a meaningful conversation with the client and say, there are ways to structure it in a way that protects both you and respects the reality that parents want to understand how their child's data is being used. I think that when it comes to a, an education law like FERPA, we're talking about protecting student privacy and protecting the privacy of minors. And I think that as citizens, as parents, as just engaged populace, it's not going to look great if you are forcing people to give up rights in those data, in that data. And there's a reason why there are federal laws and state laws that are very clear about the protections that need to be put in place. And when it comes to the consent to use that information, it's very important that a service provider can actually talk to each individual parent, but you need to think about your relationship with a school and ensuring that the school is taking steps to notify parents of, here are the educational technology platforms that we are making available to students, and we need you to agree to have your student use those educational technology platforms. Awesome. Well, Aha, thank you. That was actually a really fascinating discussion on, on terms of service that I'd never really thought as deeply about. And so I really uh, appreciate kind of understanding a little better about sort of some of the business decisions behind, um, you know, why companies sort of enforce some terms of service for certain people and, and not so much for others. So um, thank you for that sort of insight. We actually like to ask our guests about what they're reading. Angel, what are you reading right now? I'm reading a really amazing short story collection by Carmen Maria Machado called Her Body and Other Parties. 
And it uses elements of horror and science fiction to explore questions of gender, sexuality, love, and self-determination. It's funny. It's moving. It's scary. I really can't recommend it enough. Nice. Joe, what about you? Um, well, <laughs> I'm mostly reading privacy policies these days. Um, but in my spare Aren't time... Aren't you always? Yeah. And... <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm. Uh, I've been uh, tackling big data policing. Uh, it's a book by Andrew Ferguson that looks at um, how police departments are deploying, um, basically all sorts of uh, surveillance technologies and predictive analytics in policing and what that means. Um, it's sort of scary. We need more accountability there. Yeah. Uh, public overview. Yeah, that too. <laughs> I just started the subtle art of not giving an. By Mark Manson. I really we love have a sound style. Effect, like a. <laughs> That's why I said not you know I... the whole thing. <laughs> um, although in, in, in on his actual book it's a, an asterisk, so you know I, okay. I I couldn't actually you know I wish there was a sound effect for an asterisk, but um, I've, <laughs> I've I've read a lot of his online stuff. It's really good, but I'm excited to read like an actual book by him so maybe I'll, I'll drop some of those self-help tips in the next episode <laughs> well Angel thank you so much for joining us today I think we forgot to mention that you're coming to us live from New York I think it's great to get an outside the valley startup perspective and I think you might have my dream job this was fun yeah come I, out to New York yeah I am on Twitter <laughs> I'm at Sigfrendo which is s-i-e-g-f-r-i-e-n-d-o ah. Yeah, you will come. Let us know when you're out here. Um, in the meantime, if you enjoyed the show, rate, review on iTunes, spread the word, and share with your friends. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>